Hello, my name is Philip Travis. I'm a professor of history, and this week's lesson is on the ancient history of Rome. The history of Rome is a long period of time with many, many changes and many, many events. It's a period of time that lasts over a thousand years, and it's one of the most significant periods in ancient Western civilization. In this image here, you see, of course, the famous Roman Colosseum. You see also a couple of images from the Roman Forum. The large arch below to the left is the Constantine Arch, which is just outside of the Colosseum, dedicated to the Emperor Constantine, one of the latter emperors of Rome, obviously associated with the Christianization of Rome. And, of course, the picture above is a picture, one of the many pictures that I will show you from the Roman Forum. The history of Rome is really centered around three phases, a phase of monarchy, a phase of republic, and a phase of empire. On this map, you can see the various breakup of different groups on the Italian peninsula at the time of Rome's development as an early republic and monarchy. And early Rome was really made up of a combination of leadership from both Rome and from the Etruscans to the north. And one thing to consider when we study this history are the lessons that the modern world can take from this long period of history and from the transitions from a monarchy to a republic and to an empire. And we, we will see particularly when we look at the demise of the Republic and some of the problems associated with Rome's expansive empire, we will see, I think, many lessons that the modern world can glean from studying this important period of time. Here you see an image of the Roman Forum from one of the hills surrounding the Forum. The Forum was really the place where administration and government and other activities went on amongst the, particularly the Roman aristocracy, during the height of the Roman state. Rome was originally founded uh, as a really a combination between the Etruscans and the Romans, and these groups were Indo-European groups initially that had migrated probably from Anatolia, uh, probably during the Bronze Age, and then populated the various areas of the Italian peninsula. The Etruscans made up several of the first Roman kings. The Etruscans, they are a group that we don't know a great deal about today. Uh, what we know about the Etruscans really comes from Roman interpretations of the Etruscans. And the Romans tended to paint the Etruscans as uh, rather pleasure-seeking, uh, they like to drink a lot of wine. Uh, they were somewhat more hedonistic, I suppose you might say, than the Romans. The Etruscans were associated with uh, drinking stronger wine. The Romans, of course, also drank wine, but tended to cut their wine with water. Um, and so the Romans saw themselves as more disciplined and practical, and they saw the Etruscans in their own historical narratives as somewhat more opulent, opulent and extravagant. Uh, this may or may not be entirely true, but the Etruscans made up several of the first kings of Rome, and of course the interpretations of the Romans, uh, of the Etruscans, could be problematic uh, because the fall of the monarchical period of Rome actually occurs in um, a case, in a Roman story, in which an Etruscan king, his son, a prince, rapes a Roman aristocrat's daughter. And this becomes known as the myth of Lucretia. And Lucretia was raped, and in response to this, the Romans rose up and they ousted the Etruscan king and created uh, the Roman Republic. Lucretia, who had had her, um, her virtue defiled, would commit suicide. And the ideal, Lucretia, the myth of Lucretia becomes sort of an ideal characterization of the Roman female, that a Roman female should be virtuous um, and chaste, and, um, and any defiling of that virtue was to be taken very seriously. Now, if you look through the history of Roman 
history, you'll find that there are many, 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 many cases where this is not the case. But this is a, an ideal at the core of the meaning of Roman culture. Likewise, the ideal Roman man, Rome was a patriarchal society, was often depicted in during the Republic era in the depiction of the Roman figure Cincinnatus. Um, during the Republic, there was no monarch or emperor. You know, the Republic was ruled through um, the Senate, which we'll talk about more in a second. But during a time of war and during a time of emergency, um, the Senate, Rome, would appoint a dictator. And a dictator was not uh, really the way we think about dictator today. It was not about uh, being a permanent authoritarian ruler, but rather it was about having a ruler in place who could make decisions quickly um, in a time of emergency. And Cincinnati becomes a dictator, and he wins the war, if you will, and then he gives up that status, and he returns to his farmland and goes back to being, a, 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 a if you will, an ordinary uh, Roman citizen. And so his sort of role as a, as, as a noble, practical um, Roman citizen who does the right thing for the state also is... Um, sort of an ideal type uh, in Roman culture of what a Roman man should aspire to, much like Lucretia sort of uh, epitomized that which the Roman woman should aspire to. The city of Rome was established on the Tiber River. It was located about 18 miles inland on uh, a western flowing river, a river that could not easily be navigated up to the city. It had seven hills surrounding it, and you can kind of get a feel for the hilly nature from this picture here of the Roman Forum. And of course, to the east, down the spine of the Italian peninsula, you had the Apennine Mountains. These, these natural sort of geographic features made the early city of Rome a sort of naturally defensible and protected area. The Tiber River was not a river that could be sort of uh, easily navigated upriver to assault the city from the sea. The city was, again, located about 18 miles inland, so it wasn't right on the water. The Seven Hills made it relatively easy to provide defensive outposts and so forth. And, of course, the mountains going down the spine of the Italian peninsula also provided defensive protection for those that might assault Rome. During the early period of the Roman Republic, Rome was really, uh, it's a small state. It's, a, it's really a city-state in a lot of respects with a hinterland. Uh, you have the Roman city, and then around it you have the various hinterland. But during the Republic, it is not a sort of large, far-flung expanse, and it does not even remotely control um, the entirety of the Italian peninsula, at least in the outset of the Republic. Now, when you get to... Um, uh, a couple hundred years into the Republic, then you start to see that expansion occur. The Republic is really, it's designed to be a civilian-led sort of representative state, though the representative state is not a mass democracy. It's a very limited sort of representative Republic. It's not a military state initially. Um, in fact, in the early Republic, military figures like the formal military was not even allowed to be inside the formal city of Rome. Rome was run by the Roman Senate, and the sort of, um, the sort of executive of this entity were two consuls. And the consuls were appointed by the Senate. They were basically the chair people of the Senate. And they oversaw military and civil power. They were sort of the executives of the larger representative body. Within the Republic, there were two groups of people. You had the patricians and the plebeians. The patricians were aristocrats. Um, in the early phase of, uh, of the Roman Republic, they were the only ones with political power. And they tied their lineage to the original Roman nobles associated with uh, the period of monarchy, and that was what gave them their sort of claim to power in Rome. Uh, the plebes were really everybody else, uh, and there was a varying degree over time. I say commoners, but uh, you see commoners here, but in reality, um, the plebes really makes up 
anyone that is not in that patrician class. And so there could be people in the plebes and were people in the pleban society uh, of Rome that um, were fairly well off. Um, and ultimately, over time, had greater political power. But initially, they're commoners, and they have no political power. Um, they are basically an underclass of the early Roman society, and they are very much at the will, both politically and legally, of the patricians. As you might not be surprised, as Roman history develops, uh, as the patricians become, if you will, a smaller and smaller segment of society, the plebeians, the plebes begin to resist and demand reforms, demand a political voice. And over the subsequent 200 years of the first period of the Roman Republic, you see some really significant um, accomplishments for uh, this large group of Roman society. By 500 BCE, you had plebeians voting. By 300 BCE, there, it was agreed that one consul must be a pleban, and eventually the plebeians have a much more significant voice in the Roman Republic and of the political decisions of uh, that state. The Roman Forum, and here you see two pictures of the Roman Forum. One to your left is a close-up of the Roman Senate building. And of course, you can see that building here on the right as well when you have the picture from one of these large hills that surrounds the low-lying Roman Forum. This is where the governing actions happened. This is where the operations of state happened. This is where ceremonies and events happened. Um, located just next to the Roman Forum, though it was not built until the period of Emperor Vespasian um, at the beginning of of, um, uh, of the Roman imperial period, the great Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum is located not far from what you see the other direction, but you will, you will see a picture of that uh, shortly. But the Senate is where these decisions were made and the Republic was driven by the Senate. And of course, in if you look in the forum on the right, you will see, for example, the triumphal arches, you will see some of the columns that remain. It was in this area where uh, Julius Caesar was was murdered and uh, and so this is where really the the operations of state occurred interestingly this was a place that eventually after the rome had fallen uh, because it's so low lying had actually been buried in many feet of silt and a lot of the things that you see here now had to be excavated in the much more recent history um, and in fact during periods like um, the medieval period in europe um, the, the ruins that you see them now would, would, would not even be visible. They had to be excavated. Expansion, of course, Rome becomes associated with significant expansionism. Uh, Rome becomes eventually known as the largest, most significant empire, perhaps of um, the ancient world, if not ever. Roman expansion, however, did not come from a sort of a, a sort of intentional desire to sort sort of control the known world or the Mediterranean world. Uh, as Rome began to develop as a state, it naturally faced rivals and wars with its various competitors on the Italian peninsula, and many of the the conflicts that Rome fought at this time were fought. Um, out of largely national security or defensive reasons. And eventually, they led to control, occupation, and adapta or adoption of those other parts of Italy into the larger Roman state. But it was not something in the Roman Republic's period that was initially something that was sort of purposely thought of as a goal to sort of conquer the entirety of the Mediterranean world. Um, instead, it started largely as a defensive expansion, uh, wars of national security and so forth, in which ultimately um, maintaining and expanding territory and influence became a vehicle for um, security and eventually a, a vehicle for, for power, uh, for wealth, um, and other types of, of things. By the 3rd century BCE, uh, Rome has expanded to really control the entirety 
of Italy and much of the Mediterranean, including, of course, Greece. Rome will, will, will of course, ultimately control Greece. They will control uh, much of the Near East. They will control much of North Africa, uh, Egypt, for example, and eventually extend up into Europe. The way the Romans controlled their empire was allowing, largely allowing conquered people to run their own affairs as long as they did a few things. One, provide soldiers and military support. Two, obey Roman generals and their magistrates and make no allowances with anyone but Rome. Uh, the Roman state also, also extended citizenship. Initially, that citizenship was extended to people in Italy. As we see Rome becoming more and more expansive, you will see other efforts to extend citizenship to individuals in areas outside of the initial heart of the Republic. The most significant event in the period of expansion of the Roman Republic were the Punic Wars, and they were broken into three different parts. And these were the conflicts between Rome and Carthage. They lasted from 264 to 146 BCE. And, of course, they're famous for events like uh, the general, the Carthaginian general Hannibal, conquering much of Italy as he invaded Italy from um, over the Alps, um, down into the, in, into the internal territory of Italy, um, and causing a great deal of destruction. Eventually, of course, Rome will, in the Third Punic War, which is really just a call to destroy Carthage, uh, Rome will really destroy and annihilate much of Carthage as it is, as it is known. Carthage and Rome were like natural enemies. It's really not surprising that the two fought these conflicts. Carthage, and I'll show you on a map in a moment, Carthage was originally uh, an outpost of the Phoenicians, so going back to you know, the 1200s or so, uh, the seafaring trading entity uh, of, the, of the Phoenicians. And Carthage really came to be a very powerful Mediterranean entity, controlling areas in Italy, uh, controlling areas in Sicily, and areas of the Iberian Peninsula, and of course, North Africa. They were a very strong trading ent entity, and as Rome expanded and Carthage expanded, it is not surprising that the two started to go to war over things like trade, wealth, and influence. Again, looking at this map, you see the natural rivalry that Rome and Carthage would have. Uh, the red and the orange would have been areas uh, of, of the Roman influence and control, and the, the other colors, of course, would have been, over periods of time, areas that Carthage would have controlled. And Carthage was centered in the purple here in North Africa. Um, and so the two were really natural competitors. The Punic Wars, of course, lasted a long time. There were several phases, and this expansionist period in Roman history and these wars really had some long-ranging consequences for Rome. The consequences of the Punic Wars for Rome were really fundamental to, to the demise of the Republic. As Rome expands and engages in costly wars, uh, wars that require long-term sacrifices from everyday Roman people, um, as Rome continues to expand, you see a fundamental change in the socioeconomic makeup um, of the Roman state. And this carries significant consequences for the Roman Republic. When the Punic Wars are happening, one, one of the things that, that naturally occurs is the destruction of farmland. When Hannibal invades Italy, uh, this devastated a lot of the farm produce ability um, on the Italian peninsula. And the result of that, of course, was that a lot of small farmers um, would lose much of the land that they had controlled. As small farmers who went to war sort of lost their lands or their lands were destroyed in the war, large landholders, aristocrats, began to buy up the land. You have a widespread development of slavery in, in, in Rome at this time as well. 
And, of course, this gives rise to slave wars, like the slave war of Spartacus, for example, which is one of the most remembered of the slave wars in the aftermath of the Punic Wars. In Roman society, typically, when soldiers went off to fight a war, and they returned from the war, the Roman leadership and the Roman Senate and later the Roman emperor would typically reward the soldiers, particularly with land. Um, land at the time, you know, Rome is uh, very much um, a, a farming civilization. Uh, it's not an urban civilization. And so the ability to farm and to have land w was vital to people's wealth. Well, with the expansion of these large landholders and what is known as the development of the Latifunda system, the Latifundia system, which were these large uh, plantations run by slaves, slaves seized in wars, for example. As you have a sort of consolidation of, if you will, large-scale control of the land by few powerful individuals, you also witness a, a, a rise in general hardship for everyday Romans. You had a rise in landless Romans, Romans who owned no land. You had, as a result of that, a rise in the urban population of the city of Rome. More people go to the city of Rome. You have a consolidation of oligarchy controlling Rome. This created a lot of social problems and economic problems in Rome. And, and, and there were attempts at reforming this problem. The most notable attempt at reform came from Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, the Gracchi brothers. And this is a depiction here of Gaius Gracchus speaking before uh, the Pleban people, the Council of Plebes, during um, a period of reform attempted by the Gracchi brothers. The Gracchi brothers were plebes, and they led the Council of Plebes, or the Tribune of Plebes, which was a very significant um, um, was a very significant political entity at this time. And they advocated for reform. They wanted hunger relief, food relief for the people of Rome. They wanted to do land reallocation, which was not well received with powerful aristocrats, with the oligarchs. Uh, they wanted to effectively provide land to, you know, the poor of the Roman people and Roman soldiers who have not had their, if you will, who have not been given what, what they were sort of due from the Roman state for their sacrifices. The Gracchi brothers attempt reform, but they fail. They're both assassinated, and they're assassinated by groups of the optimates, the the Optimates were a high-level sort of political organization of elites in Rome, and they, and they had them murdered and assassinated because they opposed these reforms, which would have undermined the sort of aristocratic control that these groups had in Roman society. So you've witnessed war and expansionism. And with that war and expansionism, we see some real issues here. You have an increasing stratification of Roman society, meaning that power and wealth and control is con increasingly consolidated in the top. And you have increasing sort of inequality on the, uh, for the masses of people, for the commoners, a lack of land owning opportunities. You have a rise in the use of large scale slave plantations. So you have some serious issues here. Then you have political problems as the Republic uh, begins to be increasingly run by a select few, which of course it was initially run by a select few. But the attempts through years to sort of create a more representative society were now seemingly dwindling away. And this creates further problems in Rome. Here you see uh, on the left, these are the ruins of the amphitheater at Capua, or the Colosseum at Capua. This area, this location, was a training place for gladiators like Spartacus. Um, Spartacus, of course, oversaw what is the most romanticized and famous of the slave wars, and this was known as 
as the Third Servile War, or the Spartacus Slave War, or the Gladiator War. And this was in 73 BCE. Slavery began, became increasingly, increasingly used on, by large plantation estates in Italy, and it could be quite brutal. Now, the Capua Amphitheater is right around here, to the south of Rome, near Naples. It's just north of the city of Naples. And ultimately, you will see slavery not only used on the Italian peninsula, but you will see uh, you will see slavery basically be widespread on Sicily. And Sicily is almost like a slave colony uh, for the Italian peninsula during the height of the Roman state. Of course, the slave wars fail, but they speak to some of the... Uh, the real issues brought on as warfare brings in more territory, brings in more slaves, results in increasing consolidation of, of land by powerful groups, and slavery, gladiatorial games become um, more commonplace elements of, of Roman society. And by the way, even though the Capua Amphitheater here, this Colosseum you see here, while it is very much uh, in a state of disrepute, uh, related to that of like the Colosseum in Rome, this is actually probably the first um, Roman um, Colosseum of that type, and it was probably the model for the larger Roman Colosseum. The failure, the Punic Wars, and the failure of the reforms of the Gracchi brothers really opens the door to a first century that is really dominated by periods of civil war. And Julius Caesar's rise in these civil, civil wars is really just one part of long-running long running rival campaigns, and in some cases, reigns of terror during the first century as powerful military figures seek to take control of the Roman state. And these included in individuals like the General Pompey or the General Lucius Sulla, who was associated with, with a horrifying reign of terror that left some 10,000 of his, of his political opponents dead. Ultimately, it is, of course, Julius Caesar who sort of prevails in the first century, uh, in these civil wars of the first century. Caesar had been serving militarily in Gaul, so he was fighting um, north in, in Europe. And he returned to, he had already kind of rose in um, Roman political, the Roman political state. And in Rome, once Rome begins expanding, one of the number one vehicles for movement um, to positions of, of recognized authority in Rome was through military campaigning as a, as a general who built the support of soldiers and likewise in successful campaigns, uh, the sport and the allegiance of the people. Famously, uh, Caesar, during a period of political turmoil in 49 BCE, uh, Caesar famously in one of the, the, the ultimate sort of most remembered events in Western civilization, crosses the Rubicon River. And the crossing of the Rubicon River is really a moment where in, 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 in Western civilization, the crossing of the Rubicon becomes symbolic for a decision from which there is no turning back. So Caesar crosses the Rubicon and he begins, he marches on Rome. Eventually seizing Rome and taking power. He was a ruthless leader, but he was also a people's leader. Um, he extended citizenship and building projects and employment uh, for people. He confiscated wealthy lands and reappointed them to the poor and to his loyal soldiers. Uh, he undermined the Senate's authority. Uh, he basically um, scoffed at the Senate. In this way, he kind of is establishing somewhat of a model for future uh, emperors, for some of them. He undermined the Senate's authority. And of course, even though he was quite popular amongst the people of Rome, uh, Julius Caesar, of course, created many political enemies in the Senate 
in this period of time, and this led to his assassination in 44 BCE, after which, which, after which followed 13 years of, of conflict as his adopted son, Octavian, Mark Anthony, and Cleopatra became involved in a large, Cleopatra, of course, the queen of Egypt, became involved in a significant um, competition for power in Rome. Eventually, Octavian, Julius Caesar's adopted son, will win this period of, co uh, of contest. He will uh, track down Mark Anthony and Cleopatra. Uh, he will eliminate his political rivals and become the first of the Roman emperors in marking the development of what is known as the Pax Romana. <laughs>